discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, moving on first, uh, Patrick, the city of Madison, myself, would like to express our condolences for the passing of your father. We're, we're very sorry to hear about his loss, and please keep us informed of the arrangements, if you would, please. I will. Thank you very You're much. Welcome, Move on to resolutions or bills. We have one bill or one resolution tonight, and that is resolution number 44C 2022, resolution of the City of Madison, Indiana, Common Council regarding the acquisition of real property. Whereas the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, the Council, pursuant to Indiana Code 36 1 10.5, desires to acquire certain real property as described in Exhibit A hereto pursuant to the terms of a purchase agreement set forth in Exhibit B, and whereas the Council has obtained two appraisals for the property in accordance with the law and hereby adopts those appraisals as Exhibits C and D, <coughs> and whereas the Council desires to purchase property for its total purchase price of $15,566, which is below the average of the two appraisals of $19,500. And whereas the council believes that the purchase of the property is in the best interest of the city of Madison, Indiana, and citizens thereof. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, as the legislative and fiscal body of the city of Madison, states as follows The two appraisals for the property obtained by the council as attached as Exhibit C and D, as required by law, are hereby accepted and approved. The purchase agreement set forth in Exhibit B is hereby approved. And the council authorizes the mayor to undertake negotiations for the acquisition of the property at a price not to in excess of the average of two appraisals to execute any and all necessary documents. This resolution shall take immediate effect upon its adoption by the council. Council, I'll give you a little bit of background on that. Uh, we've talked about uh, numerous property acquisitions over the last couple of years, and we've made them along our riverfront, along our hilltop. Uh, over by the gateway near the bridge. You'll see already a lot of uh, action happening in many of these areas, either cleaning up the properties or planning for their development. Uh, this particular parcel is important to the city because it will provide off-street parking for John Paul Park, something that we've never had over there. In addition, as part of the master park planning, there is a small playground right across uh, the street from this parking area which we intend to also upgrade and uh, uh, the acquisition of this parcel will accomplish a couple things for us. So I wanted to, uh, happy to answer any questions about, about the parcel. We had budgeted for this uh, in the 2022 uh, budget. So money, is, money has been appropriated for this, this property acquisition. I have a, a few comments. I'm having a hard time understanding why the city needs this parcel. Um, Nobody's going to use it for parking because it's at the foot of probably the steepest hill in Madison, and nobody's going to walk up that hill. We already have the lot across the road where the former concession stand was torn down. The playground, there's no children that live anywhere in that neighborhood anymore, and we have uh, Gaines Park over on Broadway that could fill that need. Um, it's also in the floodplain, so building on it's going to be incredibly difficult. Uh, I just don't. And, and further, the, the parcel itself doesn't include the hillside, so we can't build a staircase going up to the top to use the park. So I, um, and the purchase agreement, I guess this would be a question for Joe, is it void? It was supposed to be executed within 90 days, but it was signed last year. That's all I had to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? And I'm happy to address Patrick's uh, along the way here. So we don't intend to build on that. It's a gravel parking lot for parking cars. It's used for parking. Uh, you're right, is it, it is at the bottom. It's at the bottom where the entrance into the ballpark is. Um, and. Uh, you're correct. We did not acquire the hillside because we didn't want the hillside because right at the top of the hillside are uh, the Pittman garages. So there's no useful uh, land uh, to acquire beyond the, the gravel lot, which has already been graveled for parking. Uh, relative to the playground, uh, one of the reasons that playground isn't used is because it's so, so outdated. Uh, but there are a lot of children that come to the ballpark um, 
when their when their family members are, are playing there. And then just west of there is a mobile home community uh, which lacks any amenities at all for the playground. Uh, yes, it's true, we are making upgrades to uh, the uh, um, Gaines Park on, on Broadway Street, uh, but that doesn't negate the need for some level of uh, investment by the city there. And the lot across the street from this gravel lot is un it's unpaved, it's a grass lot, it's muddy, it's adjacent to the creek. I, I mean, I, I, I believe there's many reasons to acquire this particular property, uh, which doesn't become available very often. So that's why we propose and appropriated uh, the money for it. And it's at a, at a fair price. Is there anything else in the, or anything in the master park plan for John Paul Park specifically as far as any renovations in the next few years, improvements? Uh, like the staircase from the softball field up to the, the top is pretty much gone at this point. Sure. Is there anything we've laid out, lined out so far? Um, we've been making gradual improvements there, cleaning up the property, mowing the hillside that's adjacent to the ballpark. We need to do work there. It's the lacked investment for many, many years. As you go through there, it's a beautiful park, and it is our founder's park, so it does need cared for. Uh, you'll see an assortment of uh, new pads and benches uh, in partnership, I believe it was, D was a DAR that we worked with, Carla, yes. on getting those there. So there's going to be some additional plans there um, for, for new investment. And I'll let Carla's on the parks board and also works with DAR, and she can elaborate further on John Paul. I have, and we did meet with um, um, a Mason guy um, just about a week ago about the old fountain, which is like the big rock wall in the middle of the park, and turning that into like a giant planter, like restoring the wall, but not making it a fountain again. And the DAR ladies do, working with the parks department together, we're collaborating. We do have lots of plans for that. Now our pipe dream is, you know, millions of dollars, and so that'll probably never happen. But we do have a series of things that'll be happening over the next year that trying to draw people in. Um, we're hoping to eventually maybe even get a music in the park concert there every once in a while. And so I do believe that parking at some point will become an issue if we make the park what the plan is. Um, and especially for the people who play softball, that parking lot on the lower level to walk right out onto the ball field is makes for easy access. But our dream as a parks department and then along with the DAR ladies is to make that a park that people do want to go to, to walk through, to spend time at. So we do have some um, plans in the making right now. It's mostly landscaping at this point, but we do have bigger plans. We could drop a load of gravel on the old uh, concession stand lot for far less than $15,566. Where is that exactly that you're uh, referring to? Is that the right, lot? Right north, uh, like right north adjacent, adjacent to the, to the, creek to the that, ballpark. That experiences flooding. Uh, I'm not sure making that a gravel parking lot would be a good, good investment. For but you're not referring to the parking lot at the top of the hill that is owned by First Baptist Church. Okay. Probably do need a motion in a second if we're gonna, to move this along. A motion that we ex uh, accept uh, resolution number 44C-2022 as written. I second the motion. May I ask how, how many, approximately how many parking spaces we're talking about in this area? Probably 15, I'd say, okay. in that area. You know, there's, uh, it's enough to accommodate those who are playing there and the equipment that they bring for the game, I think it's a great location uh, and will serve a good purpose. And candidly, uh, you know, the ability to acquire property adjacent to a park, whether you want to use it now or use it later, it does give us options. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there any questions from the audience or comments? Okay. Seeing none, we'll do a roll call. 
Tantatillo? Yes. Bartlett? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Lucy Dottillo? Yes. Krebs? Yes. Tevano? No. Okay. Thank you, Council. Uh, moving on, reports, recommendations. Uh, is there any other business from the standing or select committees of the City Council we need to take on tonight? Hearing none, uh, we do have a board appointment recommendations that we continue for 2023, which would be the reappointment of the following board members, Mike Pittman, Caroline Rogers, and Tom Stark to the Historic District Board of Review, and reappointments of Shirley Kleffer and Aisha Corey Nelius to the Human Relations Commission. Uh, like to have a motion to approve these uh, reappointments, please. I move that we approve the reappointments. I'll second. Okay. Any comments or questions? Um, I'll be voting no on these recommendations. Uh, it has nothing to do with the reappointments to the HRC, but I've been disappointed with um, a lot of decisions the Historic District Board of Review has made recently, especially regarding new construction downtown. There's a lot of new properties being built that do not reflect the historic character of Madison, and uh, I'm just disappointed that, that we're moving in that direction with, with a lot of new construction. Not uh, New construction's great, but need to follow the guidelines that, that we have, and, and they need to fit with the neighborhood in which they're built. Well, that's why we have the historic, these competent people on Historic District Board of Review is to adjudicate uh, the guidelines and make the best decision possible for the Historic District. And uh, um, I'm grateful for all their service. Any other questions or comments? Anything from the audience? Roll call vote. Dan Dottillo? Yes. Jim Bartlett? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Lucy Dottillo? Yes. Carla Krebs? Yes. And Patrick Tebano? No. Okay. Moving on, i um, like to have a report of our Economic Development Director, Tony Steinhardt. Uh, good evening, Council. I, uh, I'll try to keep this as short as possible, but as you know, uh, having appeared in front of you many times over the last 12 months, there's uh, been a lot of activity, and I want to thank each and every one of you for the support you've given the progress that we've made this year, which has, I think, been uh, remarkable. And um, we aren't stopping. Um, we are only beginning uh, to, to continue moving forward in those uh, goals and objectives set out forth by the city and yourselves. Um, I just want to give a quick update to let you know that we're really focused in, in the economic development uh, side of business to really uh, be partners. I've been working really hard, and I want to say that every partner that we've dealt with here in the community in a collaborative fashion <coughs> have been very, very open. And uh, just today I was with <coughs> one of these organizations for three hours uh, helping uh, show a potential uh, new business uh, around town. So. Um, I just want to continue to say each and every one of these and many, many more that aren't represented here have been, have been a great partner. I also wanted to update you a little bit on the communications. Uh, we have an updated website page uh, on the city website that outlines all our projects and opportunities. Uh, it has become transparent about who has licenses, who has tax abatements and those sorts of things. All those appear on the city website now. Uh, as well as as of um, August, we went live with our LinkedIn page, and I'm happy to report we've got about 300 and 380 followers uh, so far here in just a few months, and uh, would encourage if you aren't or any of the public to please follow our LinkedIn page. We update you on um, all sorts of both local, regional, and, and state economic development initiatives and uh, those successes here in Madison. One of the things that uh, we talk a lot about and, and the mayor has talked a lot about is data-driven decision-making. Uh, one of the things that I found early on in, um, in the city, uh, we had very little data outside of what was available through the Department of Commerce or the, the uh, Census Bureau and those sorts of sort of free services that are there. While that data is useful and, and has some, some um, good data points to it, 
um, we certainly realized that there was much more um, robust data in the marketplace. And um, it's called Placer AI. Uh, we're using this software, which is the software that most uh, large retailers and uh, tourist organizations and other large uh, service-based organizations use to help track and understand their uh, client base, their uh, participants, and their and their customers. Um, we can uh, map this uh, in a number of ways. It's a very robust system. We're sharing it with uh, our local partners, Madison Main Street and VMI and others, the Jefferson County Commissioners and others who need that. We've made this software available uh, to them. We did not get this until the end of August so that we've really been learning it and using it. But one of the great tools is, is that we've been able to use it in recruitment for businesses because I can pull the statistics uh, that those businesses use and pull all the top 25 performing stores, uh, the top 25 performing communities, have all the data of households income and then run our community and lay it right beside them to see how we're comparing so that we're actually targeting businesses that have similar or in similar size communities. So uh, it's been a very good resource. Uh, I've used it for the grocery pursuits. We're using it for the pharmacy pursuits as well as a number of other other types of things. I laid a couple examples of reports on your on your uh, desk tonight there for you to look at. Again, if you have any questions about data, don't feel feel free to just give give me a call. We've also been using this data as a way to plan for festivals. Uh, this is real time data that comes from cell phones, so we've been able to we can actually pinpoint during a weekend which intersections in town have the busiest car counts. Uh, within 48 hours of a, a weekend, we have the live data. Uh, I think Lucy and uh, Sarah and uh, Andrew at VMI have been using this, and we have pretty good, interesting numbers. Um, we have proof uh, of the number of people attending regatta, attending Chautauqua. We have, uh, I can tell you, the number of people who attend uh, and pinpoint the data for the golf course, for example, for a whole year and compare that back. So uh, I can tell you the whether they're male or female, what the household incomes are, all those things of, of the visitors uh, to our to our park system, to basically any 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 geo track as they call it area within our community. Very powerful data, and we're just starting to learn more about that. Um, some 2022 20, highlights and redevelopment. Uh, we know today in economic development, we've talked a lot about this that um, quality of life and placemaking is the X factor. I was just up at the uh, Indiana Economic Development uh, Association conference last week. The governor talked a lot about this. As you know, the state of Indiana um, had $22 billion of record uh, of investment uh, in this state. The good news is uh, 53 counties all had that success. And we're happy to report, uh, as you know, we had some of that success here in Jefferson County with a couple of expansions that we announced earlier in the year. And you helped make those happen, so we were a part of that. But his comment was is that the state has to do more in creating quality of place because the number one hindrance for us right now is workers and we have to be on the offensive to attract those workers. So Destination Indiana, IEDC, all of us are going to be working together strategically uh, throughout the state to really start telling our story in a different way. Um, it's about attraction of people to live, work and play. and not just attract people to visit. We want to attract you to visit to stay. And uh, they've got a great, great process starting to work with the uh, local uh, universities and encouraging communities to work more with local universities to keep those graduates within their uh, communities. So a lot more about uh, the X factor, but we as Madison have a great X factor. Um, we have that. Uh, we have an authentic place. But we've done a lot in the last year to, to really make that uh, a shining star. Uh, we established the Public Arts Commission because we know that arts and music and culture are so important. We're one of 12 cultural districts within the state of Indiana, and that's important to support. We just hired a consultant last month to develop the guidelines for our arts program. Uh, those will be coming before you here this next year in 2023, uh, and that process uh, will, will continue. Uh, we were able to collaborate on three public art installations within this community. One um, will be as a part of the EDA uh, for Sunrise Crossings, uh, where we had the developer uh, support that. It's not just a piece of public art, but it's a collaboration with the school system and the, and the, and the uh, kids at Madison Consolidated Schools. So they will be participating with that artist 
as a part of an artist in residency program uh, paid for by the developers. Uh, we've been able to, thanks to the lead gift of the Community Foundation, bring the first um, public rotating art uh, exhibit called Flight uh, to Madison uh, starting in March, from March to October next year. Uh, as a part of that negotiations with the artist, uh, we also will be having one of the major birds stay here in Madison as a permanent ins installation along our riverfront or Bicentennial Park. Uh, we also have been working really hard with our ready dollars this year. Uh, the city had developed a great plan. A couple of years ago, those dollars have started to flow. You're seeing construction uh, in and around the mural lot and the gateway. Uh, we also have finished uh, the final three projects and are submitting those to the RDA in January for approval. The Ohio Theater facade and marquee uh, will be restored in 2023. Uh, we will start the process on the Madison and Hanover Connector Trail and also uh, work on the parking and the HMI lot on the riverfront in support of the Bicentennial Park and Amphitheater. Uh, more highlights to continue. Uh, we made huge investments in development of the Oak Hill Park. Um, that was a great opportunity. We raised $150,000 from local businesses. It was a great public-private partnership. I think you'll see a great reinvestment in that neighborhood. Uh, it created um, generational wealth uh, for those residents. Uh, we can see today as you drive through their pride that they're taking in, in their properties. And uh, the Oak Hill Park will be completed this spring uh, with uh, an all-new two-acre park, including many amenities, basketball, shelters, a dog park, playgrounds, and cornhole. Should be a great, great event. If you haven't been up there, 90% of the concrete's complete, shelter's complete. Uh, we just planted uh, 10 five-inch diameter trees, really nice big trees uh, on that park. And uh, uh, again, very happy to all our community partners who participated. We partnered with Habitat for Humanities as a part of our housing strategy. They're developing six uh, new home sites and we'll be uh, bidding that infrastructure work out in the spring. Um, worked on the development of a housing strategy. One of that was we announced 183 units of um, apartments, uh, workforce housing on the uh, residences at Sunrise Crossing. We also are working on market rate housing with a number of potential developers here, both on the hilltop and downtown. And, and housing will become a major focus in 2023 as we look at strategy. The key thing about housing in our community is we realize that housing at all levels, uh, all market levels in our community is short. It creates a, a domino effect when you can't move up, which doesn't free up the, where you're leaving. So it's hard to go from a $150,000 house to a $250,000 house to a $250,000 house isn't here. So it's a domino effect when you can't move up. Uh, we're 3,000 housing units short, as the state has told us, and uh, we certainly, I think, can see that, feel that, and understand that, and that's one of those things that we have to sort of be proactive about doing that. We're looking at other residential TIF and some other options as, as a part of creating some momentum in our housing at all levels, again, in the community. Uh, stormwater improvements for the Cro 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 Crooked Creek watershed was a really important thing. Uh, this year, we were able to collaborate and partner with the development of Sunrise Crossing to have some real synergy and create a win-win uh, for the community there and the Cro Cro Crooked Creek watershed. Um, and as you know, we will be um, holding water and releasing it over time on the hilltop that would typically be running right into Crooked Creek and Walnut Street and all those areas that have received some great flooding. So it was a good opportunity for a win-win for the city, those residents, and the hilltop. Um, and we've been working on uh, the replacement of the iconic uh, Crystal Beach swimming pool. Uh, as you know, uh, that pro project is underway and we're working through the final financial strategies for that uh, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, we can do that. Uh, we, uh, we received uh, last week one bid on Thursday. Uh, that one bid was $8 million and a few, few, few cents. Um, unfortunately, it was, as we know, a little bit over the budget. Uh, $2 million to be exact. Uh, unfortunately, we only had one bidder. We had five interested bidders uh, about two days before. And unfortunately, supply chain and contractor labor shortages kept those other four bidders from submitting a bid. Uh, we are working with our designers, the Board of Public Works, our fi uh, financial partners, and uh, we'll ultimately be working with you to, to develop a, a strategy here over the next uh, couple weeks. Uh, we have taken the one bid under advisement. 
Um, as you know, we had uh, no bidders for Michigan Road Project as we bid that twice. Uh, and when we rebid the project for uh, Crystal Beach earlier on the demolition, uh, we made a bunch of scope changes uh, and the prices went up uh, with the exception of one bid. So we, we're, we're happy we have a bid and we're going to work through trying to, to uh, you know, we're taking a gamble if we go out for a rebid right now, given the market environment, the status of concrete and some of these other things. Uh, so um, that's where we are. Mary, would you have any other comments on Crystal Beach? Just that uh, we ran into a similar dynamic when we were bidding the full house construction. It was at the early stages of uh, this, the disruption. It was at the tail, you know, tail end of, of COVID, but certainly the market was already being disruptive, if you recall, when we accepted the bids for the full house uh, restoration. The, we had three bidders, and the lowest bid was 40% over our estimated cost for the full house. Um, I think we made the right decision then because of the disruption in the marketplace uh, to find the capital to, to proceed. We did. And, um, you know, the market has only gotten more difficult uh, since then. And now we're, now we're seeing it all across the city with our projects. But, uh, you know, given the inflationary environment, uh, the labor constraints, the supply chain issues, it's a difficult construction environment. But uh, we're looking at it as a risk management. Uh, element uh, to determine what the best approach is for uh, the Crystal Beach restoration. But we'll have the recommendation here within the next two weeks. Um, the, you know, highlights for economic development. Um, you know, we, we have uh, met with over two dozen uh, large and small business opportunities in the Madison area this year. <coughs> Happy to report several of those happened and we had collaborative partners that worked with us on many of those opportunities. We are uh, continuing to work uh, very diligently and daily on both the grocery and pharmacy interests. I uh, entertained today another pharmacy interest in, in Madison for uh, a potential downtown location. So do realize that the grocery and pharmacy uh, are our number one, one uh, priorities in economic development for downtown. And that, that's to create Madison as a regional destination for shopping, both on the hilltop and downtown. They complement each other if we look at it that way. Uh, and I, I believe um, we do and, and they will in, in the long run. We signed our first exclusive agreement with the American Queen Voyages. We're very pleased that um, the VMI and other organizations in this community have been working with them for years. And uh, we were able to sign an exclusive agreement with them where they, they were providing some capital for some improvements as well as impact fees. Uh, for docking and having the right to dock here in the city of Madison, uh, first of its kind. And then uh, in terms of communications and connecting the dots, we conducted our first real estate summit, What's on Tap Madison, in the spring and invited the Indiana Realtors Executive Director here uh, to talk as well as update the community on priorities and get their feedback on their concerns uh, and um, thoughts on the housing market. Um, we presented and passed, as you know, a resolution to add additional Riverfront District liquor licenses. As a part of that, we extended three to Pizza Uncommon, the Red Bicycle Hall, and the Ohio Theater. Uh, we established a redevelopment authority to create more flexibility in leveraging and investing in projects uh, throughout the community. Uh, one of those projects was the bonding authority for the Crystal Beach Pool. Uh, we sold uh, city property and assisted uh, a homegrown small business River City Printing to expand in the industrial park. Uh, we secured economic development incentives and an EDA for the $30 million expansion of the Super ATV project and their commitment to bring 315 new jobs uh, to Madison. Uh, we assisted the county and the city in approving a $165 million investment in a battery storage facility by Open Road Renewables and that project is still ongoing through the county process. And we've been uh, working with the Madison Railroad in developing a transload facility on the hilltop that will allow us to un unload and load um, both products for that last mile or bring the products to that facility to load for their train ride to their final destination. As you know, there was a lot of new businesses in town. We had a very robust year downtown. Uh, there was 18 new small businesses added downtown. Our Madison Main Street program continues to do a great job and we've got a great co collaborative relationship with them. As you also know that we've added other and announced other uh, uh, projects, both with city and without city investment. I will tell you that 
Uh, the national uh, retailers are very interested in Madison. We should not shy away from that. Um, it, it creates the plan of creating Madison as a regional destination. Uh, we have other retailers interested. Uh, I would remind those on the hilltop that our hilltop is really full as it relates to vacant property and opportunities to construct. We have one small uh, old um, facility that does not have a lot of occupancy, but outside of that, um, our hilltop is full, uh, Clifty Drive in particular, from, from uh, big lots uh, all the way to Walmart. Um, we do have uh, uh, other things that have been, been, been coming to town, scooters, uh, which is under construction. The Take 5 car wash has been approved and will be starting construction soon. Casey's has announced two stores, uh, and we've been working with others uh, here. Uh, hopefully in the coming months we'll be able to make some announcements. But the big, the big project on the hill is uh, Sunrise Crossing, and I'll, I'll just uh, play this video here. Uh, it was taken yesterday of the progress, and I'll sort of show you what you're talking about here. If we can get this to start. Well, here we go. It worked. So as you're looking here, uh, on the uh, left is the Hobby Lobby pad, 405, and uh, TJ Maxx. If you're looking down, you have the, the apartment buildings would be in this zone. To the right is the retention basin. Three million square feet of water will be held and retained for pools. Um, you notice that we've uh, been in, in installing landscaping and working with the neighbors uh, to try to help get the new shed as best as we can. Um, to the neighbors, south side, you can see the, the remaining 30-foot buffer of the existing tree. The, sun, the new pump station will be up here. We brought in a new 42-inch storm line that brings the water into this facility. And this will be the fourth store to be had uh, for this location. Crestwood Drive will come in uh, and will turn into the apartment complex right here. Uh, a potential restaurant or other retail. Uh, the public park will be We're thankful the developer is having the Wonderland Studios do these. Um, it's been fun to watch watch the progress. Uh, and again, these types of things are on our website, um, uh, available for public use. But I'm proud tonight to be able to announce finally, after six months of hard work and negotiations uh, and uh, rolling up the sleeves in some regard, the fourth retailer at the shops at Sunrise Crossing is Kohl's. Kohl's Department Store is uh, bringing a 39,000 square foot uh, small store concept to Madison, Indiana. And uh, we hope that uh, along with the other three shops that we will all have a new place to shop for Christmas 2023. So happy to announce Kohl's and uh, it's been a long work. We didn't think it would take this long when we had the groundbreaking, but um, corporate America just takes some time. So we're excited today to announce uh, Kohl's joining the other retailers uh, at Sunrise Crossing. Uh, we now will work, uh, and have been working, but we'll work now for the out parcels and the other, the other parcel as well as we work to uh, attract those res re uh, restaurants and other uh, small national retailers uh, in that center. Uh, now that we've announced the four, that will be a little bit of uh, an easier task because uh, everybody looks at who's, who's made those decisions. And finally, some uh, just a quick uh, couple 2023 priorities. Certainly, we're going to continue our long-term relationships we have with the state and our regional economic development organization. I was able to attend a site selection conference in Florida this year and start to understand the, the work that's being done to attract um, $40 billion deals to this country on the, re, on the repatriation of these projects. Uh, we're also 250 million square feet short of, of a warehouse space in this country still. Even with all the warehouses, if you drive to Indianapolis being built on along all the interstates, um, that may explain to you why concrete's high and e EPDM roofing and rubber and all those sorts of things. But um, we are we are bringing, bringing jobs back and opportunities. So we'll be working with our railroad, our tourism uh, partners, our education partners in 2023. 
Uh, investment and leverage funds for community placemaking projects is really important, as we all know and continue to talk about. Um, we'll be ready for Ready 2.0. Um, we expect uh, the governor to announce that and the legislature to approve that. Uh, it is all about the X factor. It's going to be all about placemaking, and he knows the importance of that throughout the state. A complete site selection initiative through the Indiana Depart Economic Development Corporation. We as uh, Jefferson County need to go through a site selection process uh, and determine the optimum sites that we have for economic development here in our community, and we'll be working with the state's consultant in 2023 to do that. And then they continue to look for visionary developers and businesses to invest in Madison. We have a great environment for entrepreneurs. We have a great environment for local businesses and small businesses to succeed. We have programs to help them do that. But we also need to be looking out to continue to make sure Madison is a regional player that will ultimately support the development of, of Madison as a place to live, a great place to live, work, and play, and also help those existing businesses grow and thrive. Open the floor for any questions or comments, Mary. Well, I just want to uh, thank you for all the work you and Alyssa have done this year and executing our strategy. A year and a half ago, we put together two plans as part of the Ready Initiative. One was for workforce, which predominantly focused on hilltop level investments, and the other one was destination development, which focused primarily downtown. I'm happy to say that uh, they were both uh, very have both been successful in their implementation and particularly the destination development one was um, was funded through the southern indiana rda grant process and that is culminating in multiple uh partnerships with as tony is mentioning there hanover college the um, um heritage trails ohio theater riverfront development city of madison all the business owners and tourism partners and, uh, and then on the hilltop is, is a lot about the development. So we announced that we could produce uh, through those strategies about a quarter billion dollars of economic impact and we're almost halfway through the execution of that. We're very pleased that Governor Holcomb is seeing the statewide benefit of that uh, level of commitment and leveraging state dollars to produce these, uh, these results. And uh, we're, we are already planning for the projects that didn't get fully funded in the first round of ready grant to be incorporated into a ready 2.0 because we have uh, uh, lots of work to do in the in the city of Madison uh, and across Jefferson County with our with our partnerships so Tony good presentation open it up to floor for any questions Tony Tony can you give us a reminder what's the estimated completion date for the shops and the opening yeah, so we, we expect those to be all open in the fall and, and ready for construct for I'm sorry for shopping in the Christmas season of 2023. Uh, okay, so sometime Q4 then late. Sometimes probably late Q3, early Q4. Um, not you know the out parcel shops depending on who they are and how early in the year we announce those, they may or may not be ready at that time. But we would anticipate all the shops and restaurants to be open and and finished by uh, early 2024. Again, the apartments uh, are slated, uh, depending on some funding strategy in the environment or the economy here, to start uh, as as early as next late next summer. Again, sort of staggered them so that they're not in conflict with each other. Okay. I just want to uh, commend you, Tony, and you, Mayor Courtney, for all the hard work you've put in for economic development over the last year. It's been a lot of good things moving forward with uh, economic development around here. A lot of good Thanks projects. For your support too. All right, uh, moving on, we will um, recess the regular city council meeting. As you know, we have a public hearing tonight with regards to the amendment of the rate ordinance relating to waterworks. So I will call to order the public hearing. Anybody who is here, if you've not had an opportunity to sign in, please do so. It's for public record. <coughs> and um, I will turn it over to Joe. Yeah, this is uh, the public hearing with regard to the ordinance number 2022-32, um, and that is the ordinance amending our rate ordinance um, that we will have on second reading here shortly. Um, but it is, you know, essentially it's a reflection of the um, mediated agreement that we were able to obtain with the rural water companies. So, if there's any public comment. At this time, we'll entertain that. Yep. Mic there. Thank you, Rick. There you go. Uh, Rick, Rick, Rick Ru 
is 1421 Cherokee Court. What are you talking about, Mr. Counselor? I, I, some ED, something, and I don't know what you're talking about. And guys, when you're talking on the microphone, talk into the microphone for those of us that can't hear. No. So, um, as you might recall, earlier. Thank you, Rick. Uh, probably six months ago, maybe. Yeah, about six months ago, um, we had a um, an ordinance before us that we're talking about the increase in water rates, and that was as a result of uh, several different things. But one of them was, or many of them were inflationary, um, hadn't been done in significant periods of time, and uh, and there was also some projects that we were going to be doing to upgrade our waterworks system, um, and. Uh, we had a uh, public hearings on those and different things such as that. There were some objections raised as a result of that process by um, some rural water companies, i.e. Rikers Ridge, um, DuPont, and uh, Canaan. And they have uh, you know, the ability and the right to do so and raise those objections. They did. They did those in the proper form. Um, well, that could actually be argued slightly, but um, they did do that. And um, we went to um, a mediation and um, were able to come to an agreement with them with regard to a tiered system with regard to how their rates um, would, would increase. Um, and it created a separate class of our water rates um, that we didn't previously have. So that's, the, and this is amending that previous ordinance that um, dealt with our water rates. I'll just further elaborate here that this amendment that's proposed tonight only uh, impacts uh, the three water utility resellers as part of our mediated agreement. Anything else? Any other questions from council or you can wait and do it at second reading as well. Makes no difference. Okay. We will uh, adjourn the public hearing and reconvene the uh, regular city council meeting. And now we will have the actual bill on second reading, which is ordinance number 2022-32, an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, amending rate ordinance number 2022-06, as amended by ordinance number 2022-10, relating to the rates and changes and charges for the use of services rendered by the waterworks system of the city of Madison, Indiana. Any questions or comments at this point? Uh, so back uh, in the early days of the water rates stuff, we were uh, looking at the, I guess, capital, uh, so capital improvement plan. Well, the capital improvement plan, but also the fund um, for future improvements. How does this change? Do we know how this change is going to affect that? This uh, did not impact that. In fact, we closed on our uh, state revolving fund loan last week. And uh, uh, now at the probably the first meeting in January at Board of Public Works, we will issue a notice to proceed to those contractors. It was the, uh, the rate study that was originally performed, were they able to plug back in these numbers and see what the new model looks like? Yes, it still works fine. We still have plenty of... Uh, coverage we satisfied all the all of the requirements for the SRF financing it provides the amount of working capital that we have wanted so that future phases of our asset management plan that we had approved could be implemented without borrowing if there's a copy of that available I'd like to see it anyone else anything from the public this will move on to third reading. Council, I would uh, ask if uh, there would be a motion to suspend the rules and go to I, third I move that we suspend the rules and move on to third reading. Great. Is Seconded. there a second? Seconded. Any questions or comments? All in favor? What, can I ask just one question? You may. <clears throat> this is because of the time sensitiveness of this particular ordinance. We need to close this out before the end of the year, Bob. Or yes. Mayor Courtney. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you. It would be nice if we could. Not totally imperative, but it would be. I believe nice. in our in our financing, um, we had 
60 days yeah. in order to implement this. And so we've been, we started that clock when we started the initial reading of the, uh, yeah. of the ordinance. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Council. Uh, we will have a third reading on ordinance number 2022-32 and have a roll call vote. Bartlett? Yes. Dan Dottillo? Yes. Josh Schaefer? Yes. Lucy Dottillo? Yes. Krebs? Yes. And Patrick Tevinoff? Yes. Next bill on second reading is ordinance number 2022-33, and that is an additional appropriations ordinance um, sponsored by Councilman Bartlett. Are there any questions or comments regarding this? We'll have uh, Deputy Mayor McGee be available for comment and Clerk Treasurer uh, Rampy. Any questions or comments from the public? Hearing none. Oh, I, I provided council a summary of where we are to this point. I would like to read that for the public, but would you like to get a first and a second on this yeah, before we discuss yes, if it? We, well, no, no, no. I mean, <laughs> it's it's on second, it's reading. On second reading, okay. so so All you right. you can read it into the record if that's what you want. Yes, to Yes, thank you. I just thought the public. Um, I mean, obviously, council. We've had a lot of conversations since we started the budget process, but the public, I don't know how much of that the public has been able to hear or pay attention to, so I thought it might be helpful just to summarize it for everyone. Um, this ordinance that you are looking at tonight is really the culmination of almost a full year of evaluation of our financial processes, systems, <laughs> an activity um, that came about really was initiated when we had the entire clerk's office walk out. So um, in order to do that, I mean, th this has been a partnership really of the new clerk treasurer, uh, Rampy, her new office staff, Mayor Courtney, myself, and uh, Reedy Financial, those, those uh, various staff they've assigned to our account and assistance from the State Board of Accounts throughout that entire process as well as through the auditing process that we just completed. So um, through this partnership, we have been able to not only continue the operations of the clerk's office after that departure of the entire staff, uh, we did that without interruption of payroll uh, for our staff, accounts receivable, accounts payable, those continued to happen as they should. Um, Reedy provided training for our newly hired staff and as a part of that training it's not just how do we process things and get them done but how do we do it correctly how do we work with state board accounts and do things the way they want to see them done I don't believe there had been a review of that kind <laughs> in a very long time so uh, definitely there were best practice changes there were uh, requirements change from either state legislature or state board of accounts and that they, they were not kept up with so that gives us an opportunity to get us back on track and do what they would like us to do um, it allowed us to implement best practices part of our agreement with Reedy is that they would prepare best practices for us so that when Katie's staff is out of office the new staff will have the appropriate documents to work from so we don't have this problem again. Uh, they, they can continue to update that and follow best practices. Uh, we also are implementing best practices for the budget process. I know you all remember that the budget process this year is quite different than what it has been in the past. It's going to get better, it's going to get easier, it's going to be more clear. Uh, this was a very tough year for getting everything aligned and putting it where it needs to be. So we made a, a huge, major first step in that process this year. Um, discoveries made during training and processing of the clerk's office staff um, brought some things to light that were not being done, were not being done correctly, um, that created some back payment of penalties and payments 
of things that were not being processed that we needed to cover. Uh, account, re account reconciliations that we thought were being done were actually not being done and not being done correctly. Um, and that pretty much went back the entire year of 22. Reedy had to go back and re-reconcile those accounts. That is part of what has taken so long to get our financial information where it needs to be. Um, there was miscalculations or a calculation error on FICA and PERF deductions on payroll um, for a very long time. Those had to be corrected and restored uh, in our budget and in our funds. And along with all of that, we have very outdated software in that office. Uh, we had multiple software failures and restrictions due to the age of the program, and it's not even, upgrades are not even supported anymore. So there were a lot of times where only one person could be working in the software at a time. And we're talking about paying bills, doing payroll, Reedy working on the back end, trying to figure out where everything was situated. So um, it was very frustrating. I commend Katie and her staff for sticking with it because uh, it was, it's difficult enough to learn a new role. It was especially difficult with the limitations that uh, we had in place. So the resolution that you passed at our last meeting was a budget reduction for the 2022 budget. That'll return $1.1 million to the general fund. Tonight's additional appropriation ordinance is the corresponding action to that, which will show where those funds are coming from that are gonna get put back in the general and then we will allow them to revert, to build our reserves back in the, in the general. It's called an additional appropriation because the funds that we're putting into the general were not appropriated into the general fund. So to put them in there, it is an additional appropriation. Um, they are funds that were already spent. So it's not, we're not appropriating money to spend. We're, as we said before, sort of reimbursing ourselves for things that we've already taken care of. Um, some of these dollars are unspent from the budgets outside the general fund, and uh, those will move into the general. Some are expenses that were already paid out of general that we are reimbursing ourselves out of funds from outside of general and some are to reimburse in areas where inflation caused increased in costs that were not known when we created the budget last summer. So those items are more than what was appropriated and being covered by non-general fund appropriations. Again, the theme is to get the expenses paid out of outside the general fund so that we can let funds revert in the general and build that reserve. Um, this is all consistent with our prior conversations about moving expenses into non-general fund accounts, which open up our general fund tax levy. So the details are listed for you here. I'll just briefly um, hit on some of them. The ARPA funds, we're going to reimburse for property insurance increases. The 236,000 that we covered in deficit for the TSO last year. Uh, and employee insurance that also went up. The LIT ED personal services is for employee benefits, which increased 10%. Uh, we absorbed that increase, did not pass that along to our staff. The LIT personal services, or LIT public safety personal services is in line with our budget process, moving salaries and benefit cost from MPD into the LIT fund, which is where is what the LIT fund is, uh, the public safety LIT is established for. And then MVH supplies obviously is for increased gasoline and motor oil costs that have just continued to go up and again were unknown when we completed the budget last summer. So that's a quick summary of what's being moved back into general. So the next and final step would be our typical year end transfers, which will not uh, this will take care of a lot of things that will eliminate the need for a lengthy list of transfers. Um, but it also will be appropriating dollars that have been spent outside the budget process, um, including a grant match uh, in some cases. We'll be encumbering funds remaining in this budget for expenses that are gonna ha uh, we're gonna get the bills for in January so we don't mess up our budget for 23. Uh, if 
we know those items are going to come in, we're going to encumber those funds and use them to pay the bills. Um, one example will be trash truck that went down last week. It's going to be about $40,000 to fix that. Um, we started to pay certain parts that we've purchased, but we know the bulk of that is going to come due in January. So we're going to encumber some vehicle repair funds in order to pay that bill, and we'll still have funds available in the 23 budget for other things that are going to break down <laughs> in 23. Um, and then uh, this will also include correcting processing errors that were discovered from prior clerk office operation standards. Uh, council, I'll provide you a detailed list of these uh, probably next week and um, before the meeting and the ordinance that will be passed at that 1230 special meeting will also allow us to start with operating funds in the general fund that will help us get on that path to not falling negative twice a year prior to receiving our tax uh, distributions. Eventually we'll build enough reserves that we will never fall negative. So this is uh, a huge step forward in that process. That is a historical event that has happened. Uh, I went back to 2016 and it, it happens every year, so we're going to try and, and uh, rectify that. Uh, these changes, proper training, best practices for our clerk deputies, along with a new payroll software, which starts January 1st. Uh, I congratulate <laughs> uh, Clerk Treasurer Rampy on making that decision and getting that in place. That is going to allow for great reporting that we have not been able to get before um, and just clearer financial information. So I'm very excited about seeing that change go in place. Uh, she's also instituted new procurement procedures. We're just starting on that. Um, do you want me to talk about the dollar amount for the first one that you've put it's in place? Entirely up to you or I'd be happy to address it. I'll, I'll let you talk about that because that's a that's a very nice uh, improvement in our procurement process, I think. Okay, so one of the issues that um, I ran across when I was first, uh, when I first became the clerk treasurer was um, unfettered access to our Amazon account. We didn't have a central purchasing agent. There were multiple individuals throughout the entire city who had access to the city's Amazon account, which was connected to one credit card. So from my perspective, that just did not seem uh, to be best in turtle control practices from any standpoint. So I immediately requested that we cut off access for all employees and we move to a central purchasing agent. So we tracked that for the, the past year, and when he tracked it, it, it resulted in a $35,000 savings from 2021 to 2022. And that was just from doing what we should have been doing all along, which was having internal controls and not having, you know, 50 people have access to an Amazon account with no oversight. So that was essentially what was happening there. Thank you. Um, wanted to also just say that we understand financial reports in terms of fund and appropriation reports have been not submitted or put online like they well, like we would have liked, but to be honest, with Reedy working in it, us making our changes, there was never a point in time where they were going to be completely accurate. So um, once this transaction is complete, once the transaction is complete on the 30th that you hopefully will approve, uh, we will have clean reports starting January 1st with the 23 budget. Uh, Clerk Treasurer Rampey intends to have those on the website every month after we pay final bills each month and we'll provide those to council at probably the first meeting of every month so you'll have the month end from the month before. So hopefully all of this is good news and all improved <coughs> practices and you'll be able to see information clearer as well as the public. And it has been an incredible uh, project <laughs> this year, not one that we were anticipating doing, but will end up being a very good thing. Many thank you. Um, Joe, I think you wanted to maybe go back. If there's any questions from any, we can. We're in the, still in the second reading on the additional appropriation that ties to the resolution the council approved at the last meeting. 
any more questions or any questions for for Mindy. She gave a very detailed explanation as to you know the whole uh, process that is that has brought us here uh, through the end of the year with a desire to you know organically grow our, our own working capital within the general fund institute better policies procedures best practices and internal controls which is what we all want and and do that in a manner that is consistent with state board of accounts and department of local government finance can i ask just one thing mm -hmm. you i've heard us say we're paying ourselves back these so are these things that we're paying ourselves back for unex un uh, how do i say this um, unexpected expenses, or are those the things that, like the the health insurance and the such, that we pay for regularly? What? It's a combination of things. So, uh, the health insurance and our property casualty insurance, by the way, they both went up because of our renewal cycle on those. It's impossible to know when you're developing the budget what those numbers are going to be. So, we passed the budget. We were in the budget final process when our health insurance renewed this year so we're going to pick up that increase this year in this year's budget that's mm -hmm. part of it property casualty uh, renews in late january but our budget was already set so that increase is part of it the 236,000 um, negative the shortfall in tso is, is a big part of this um so those I would consider unanticipated. The fuel, the motor oil, those are mm -hmm. unanticipated. It's when I say paying ourselves back, I only mean that we appropriated funds in these places for these purposes. In some cases, we had to spend more than was appropriated because of the unintended or unexpected increases. Some were um, the ARP funds we're going to reimburse ourselves. We took that out of rainy day. So that was $236,000 out of our rainy day account that we now have a chance to put back in our general fund. We can reappropriate it next year if needed, but um, it's it's a way to sort of make us whole again. So, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I am still on. Uh, so the, the rainy day fund won't necessarily cover those expenses if they go above and beyond. Is is we need to rebuild the rainy day fund. If, if you recall, we transferred money into rainy day to pay for technology sure. upgrades. We've done all that. The camera equipment, all of that came out of it. Um, but we need to rebuild that. That's what it's there for, is for unexpected things. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If council's comfortable, because of the timeline and we're at end of year, if you're comfortable advancing to third reading to get this done, it will allow us to get these transactions on the books, run new reports, take a final look before we have the meeting on the 30th and do any final transfers. And, and the DLGF uh, 1782 yes. uh, budget process is in the wind down stage too. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, so we're doing, we just finished the, the audit, we just finished the budget process, we got our 1782s. We responded to 1782s, and now we're, our goal is to have the, uh, our 2023 budget approved before the end of the year. Their deadline is December 31st, but this is an important part of making getting all these transactions cleaned up so that our 2023 budget and uh, uh, our final year-end reports will be properly reflected. I move that we suspend the rules and move on to third reading. I'll second. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what, just out of courtesy um, and uh, just because Mindy spoke and, and said a lot of things, I didn't know if there's <laughs> anybody in the audience that wants to have any questions or comments based upon all that. Okay. Seeing none, I think that's fine. Um, we have a motion and a second to suspend the rules and move to third reading. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, we'll move on to third reading. And that is ordinance number 2022-33, and that is the ordinance regarding additional appropriations. Roll call vote, please. Bartlett? Yes. Dan Dottillo? Yes. Josh Schaefer? Yes. Lucy Dottillo? Yes. 
Carla Krebs? Yes. And Patrick Tebbin? Yes. Council, thank you very much. I really appreciate your, your questions, your patience with us as we work through this process. It's been pretty arduous no, for no one more than Katie and her staff, but a lot of people have spent a lot of time on trying to make sure that we get where we need to be. So I appreciate your partnership in that. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, uh, Clerk. Uh, now we'll move on. There's no miscellaneous items, so we'll open the floor up to public comments. If anybody's here would like to address the mayor's office and uh, city council, please come to the podium, identify yourself, and uh, make your statement, please. Rick Roos, 1421 Cherokee Court. Just listening to the news, um, the regime in, in Washington, D.C. continues to have open border policy. I mean open border policy. And I'm just wondering if the mayor's office or the council has contingency plans as far as if we have a uh, illegal immigrant dump here in Madison. And, I, and I've, I've said this informally before, and I, I think instead of trying to call churches and social workers and that type of thing, I think that part of the contingency plan is to, to borrow the school buses and put the illegals on these buses send them to Indianapolis, Louisville, or Cincinnati, who might be more capable of taking care of hundreds, if not thousands, because it's going out across the country that they're having immigrant dumps, and that's an unfortunate thing. But, uh, you know, it, it just kind of dovetails with the fact, it, I've heard rumors that a certain school on the east end of town on East Street is used as like a, an underground railroad station by a, a local renowned coyote and apparently venerated coyote as far as uh, this we're, it, it's already happening here but not through the administration but I, I just uh, illegal is illegal and we got to stand for something and the fact of you know sometimes you go into Walmart and it's like a third world country I think that's unfortunate and I, I wear this hat because it's that out of jest but you know, I wish we had more people around that wore these kind of hats. Um, I got a point there someplace, but I'm just asking it for contingency plans, uh, just as much as you'd have for uh, flooding or tornadoes or anything like that. Because I think this is a clear and present danger to the uh, sovereignty of our our, uh, our city. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. Uh, we are in contact with the governor's office all the time. We've not been made aware, you know that. You know, an issue is currently existing doesn't mean one wouldn't become. Uh, but to answer your question directly, you know, we have lots of contingency plans for emergency preparations and and other things. But uh, um, as a member of AIM and on AIM statewide legislation uh, legislative committee, uh, I'm not aware that uh, there's any particular uh, planning format that's coming down through the governor's office or to local municipalities for that. So it's something that we should constantly be aware of and particularly we focus a lot in our community for uh, public safety but uh, you know also the social service aspect of working with all the different providers in our community and we'll continue to monitor it that's probably not a good answer for you but uh, well I, I, but I think I, it starts here Bob yeah. I don't think it starts in the governor's office because is he allowed a bunch of uh, unvetted Afghani refugees into to the uh, uh, the state uh, a year ago April and I thought that was an unfortunate thing, and I'm not sure where they resided, but I think that the fact of wink, nod, you know, we can use the labor, whatnot, you know, I think it is a clear and present danger, and I think it, it whether you hear about it through a governmental agency, I, I have very little faith, other than this government down here, okay, um, as far as they know what they're doing. So, uh, but as far as, you know, we embrace in diversity, this has nothing to do with diversity. This has to in doing with embracing illegal activity. So, appreciate it. Thank you, Rick. Is there anyone else here would like to uh, address the council or the mayor's office? Um, I will mention that some of the emergency preparations we are making actively right now is for the severe weather that we're expecting at the end of this week. We've been in touch with. EMA, um, our street department, Salvation Army, uh, other organizations and planning for uh, severe weather this weekend. So we'll keep the, we'll keep council and the community posted, but you know, please take all precautions necessary 
uh, relative to severe weather and the um, warnings and alerts uh, and advisories that will be no doubt published because of that. Uh, the forecast is severe freezing weather uh, by the end of the week, some freezing rain, uh, but mostly extremely cold temperatures, uh, uh, wind chill potentially 20 below zero by, by the end of the week. Uh, we're also uh, you know, not only looking at uh, you know, just the, the humanitarian aspect of that, but impact on power uh, and continuation of services and, and public safety. Like to mention as well, um, had a great meeting earlier today with uh, Commissioner Lee with regards to working together on um, utilization of our opioid, opioid settlement funds. Um, we'll, we'll be bringing a proposal uh, through our local process first quarter. I did mention that the utility uh, project uh, will have a notice to proceed early next year and now that we've closed the SRF loan. And uh, you might have noticed um, some of our fantastic street department uh, out there um, putting up additional Christmas cheer down on the riverfront. If you get a chance uh, after you leave here, drive on our riverfront. Dave Kidwell, uh, our fantastic artist uh, in our street department, uh, welder slash artist. He has been working with Hannah and other volunteers to bring additional Christmas characters uh, to the community for um, beautification of Madison for this holiday season. And I wanna to mention too that uh, uh, they've been very busy this week. The city has invested in a sidewalk grinder. So I'm not sure if you've noticed uh, several of our street department around town. I believe they've already uh, addressed probably 40 or 50 different um, trip hazards uh, because of uh, raising of sidewalks, but the investment in a sidewalk grinder is allowing us to preserve that sidewalk, but maintain it better and make it safer by reducing the, the trip hazard. And uh, a lot of work to do, uh, continuing by the end of the year. And uh, uh, the first of the year, as Tony mentioned, I'll just highlight again, you know, Crystal Beach is gonna uh, uh, deservedly so get a lot of our attention over the course of the next, uh, next two weeks so we can finalize the financing plan and construction strategy for, for Crystal Beach. I'll pause there. We do have a special meeting on December 30th and our next regular council meeting will be Tuesday, January the 3rd. I want to wish everyone again a Merry Christmas and thanks everyone for being here tonight. I just got, got a few things to say if you don't mind. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's reached out to me to offer condolences on the passing of my father. Uh, Vic Tevinaw was one of those guys that if you were around Madison long enough, love him or hate him, you, you knew who he was and um, he's uh, it's gonna be missed by, by our family and um, uh, Services will be be private. He didn't didn't want a funeral. Uh, he he'd throw a fit if we spent a penny on a, a big funeral for him. So, <laughs> um, but uh, in in lieu of uh, flowers or anything, uh, expressions of, of condolences or sympathy could be made in the form of donations to uh, Springdale Cemetery. Um, we've got uh, a lot of family buried down there, and a lot of Madison has family buried down there, and it's a uh, and part of our our history. I, I think he'd. Uh, He'd, he'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. There's no further business. We'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. A second. All fair, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, Joe. <laughs>